Hi folks, welcome back. So over the last few videos, we've made an array of op-amp circuits using negative feedback to make all sorts of things from mixers, filters, all the way through to phaser circuits. In this video, we're going to move on to slightly more complicated circuits that use both positive and negative feedback to make ourselves a nice, simple sine wave oscillator. This is a great circuit to start with in our journey to make oscillators because it's really straightforward to build and it highlights a lot of the fundamental kind of theory behind how oscillators work and what we need to do to get them to oscillate. Also, you don't see it around that much, so hopefully it'll be interesting and new for a lot of you. Okay, so this is our circuit for today. It's the classic Vinebridge oscillator. It uses positive feedback through this scary looking, but actually quite straightforward RC network to create an oscillation at one specific frequency. So how does this work? Well, we can view this feedback network on the positive terminal as a high pass filter and then a low pass filter in series. This forms a frequency dependent voltage divider. So what is a frequency dependent voltage divider? Well, at a special frequency that we call the 3 dB point, there's one frequency in each filter that has the same attenuation and the same phase, but in opposite directions. So by arranging the filters in the feedback path like this, the two phase differences are in opposite directions, and so they end up cancelling each other out, giving us a nice phase shift of zero degrees at this terminal. So this gives us our positive feedback, and we need that positive feedback to get an oscillation going. So this signal will build up in amplitude as we continue to feed it back as it's in phase with the output. Without going into the maths, this part of the network has twice the impedance of this section, giving us a gain of one third at the non-inverting terminal. Feel free to rewind and pause if you want to know the maths, but long story short, what we're making here is a voltage divider with a gain of one third, but only at the specific frequency of the 3 dB point. Check out the capacitors explained videos I've done up in the corner if you want more information on capacitors. So what's the deal with these other two resistors? Okay, so to understand what we need to do next, we need to understand a little bit of the underlying theory behind oscillators. So there are three really important things when we're talking about oscillators. What frequency does it oscillate at? How to get it to start oscillating and how to get it to stay oscillating. The first two we can handle kind of at the same time. So you'll have noticed there's no input signal into this circuit. So essentially what happens is in real circuits, there's always going to be some noise. And that noise, white noise or any type of noise, is essentially broadband. So it contains all of the spectrum of frequencies. And so those frequencies are then passed back through feedback to our non-inverting input. And the frequency that we're going to select to oscillate at will be the 3 dB point of that feedback network. And that frequency is the important frequency because that's the frequency that we know the feedback fraction of that little network. We know that that little network is going to make a one thirds voltage divider only at that specific frequency. So that's how we get the oscillation. Now, how do we sustain the oscillation? So we need the overall gain of the whole circuit to be one. So if we've got the feedback fraction of the RC network is a third, we therefore need the gain of the op amp to be three, because three times a third is one. Okay, so here's that circuit. So the only little trap here is to realize that because we're feeding the oscillation frequency back onto the non-inverting input, this is a non-inverting amplifier, which means we use this gain equation instead of this one. So with this gain equation, we make the um, feedback ratio two, and that will give us our gain of three, which will give us our overall gain of one. Hope you're following me. So I've got a 20K resistor here. So if I put a 10K resistor down to ground here. So we've built that up, but if we have a look on the oscilloscope here, we can see that we're getting no oscillation. So what have I done? Have I done something wrong? Well, we've not done something wrong. I've actually been a little bit sneaky and I've hidden something from you that we need to think about. So I pulled a bit of a sneaky one on you there. I didn't mention how to get the oscillations to ramp up in the first place. I told you that we're feeding back the noise and that we'll select that one specific frequency, but I kind of left out the fact that we need to actually amplify that frequency only at first to get the oscillations going. So essentially what we need is we need the circuit itself to make the gain greater than one. And then as soon as we have those oscillations ramped up, throttle back the gain to be overall a gain of one. This is complicated by the fact that we don't know the exact feedback fraction because our parts have tolerances. Now, we could use trim parts and really, really carefully um, trim down all the resistors and even put variable capacitors in if we wanted, 
Or we could be smart and we can just chuck a JFET in and let that do all the hard work for us. Now I mentioned JFETs in my last video, but I didn't really have time to go into them in any detail. So here's a little aside on JFETs, how they work and how we're going to use this one in this circuit. Okay, so to understand a JFET, we need to remind ourselves about the humble diode. The diode is constructed of two regions of doped silicon. One of them's doped with electrons and we call this the n-type. The other is doped with holes and we call this p-type. For now, we can think of holes as a particle that has the same charge as an electron, but is positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. I have a whole video about diodes where I go into this in detail. But essentially, where these two zones meet, the electrons and the holes neutralize one another, and they create an area depleted of charge carriers, which acts like an insulator. It sets up this little electric field here, and that stops any charge carriers from getting across the junction. So in this little example circuit, a positive voltage will reverse bias the diode because we're applying a positive voltage to the n-type relative to the p-type. And when I apply a negative voltage, that puts a positive voltage on the p-type relative to the n-type. This changes the width of that depletion layer and prevents or allows the flow of charge through the diode. So this is a JFET. It's constructed of the same P and N doped regions of semiconductor material, but we just arranged them a little bit differently. So we can see here that we've got an N channel JFET. So down the middle is all N type material, meaning that what we do here is we apply negative voltage to the P type gates relative to the source. And this is able to constrict the channel, effectively increasing the resistance. If we keep the voltage from the drain to the source relatively small, then this JFET will act like a resistor and we can vary the value of that resistance by varying the voltage from the gate to the source. We can see that if the drain to source voltage gets too high, we can pinch off the channel completely by accident, by unintentionally reverse biasing the gate to drain junction. So we're going to be quite clever here and we're going to use this JFET to bias itself. So this is our new circuit with a JFET here in the feedback path. I'm just going to connect up our animation model to the circuit just to show how the animation relates to the circuit diagram. This is not two JFETs in parallel. We start with both the gate and the source grounded, which has the JFET fully open, as you can see. We then put a resistor from the source to the ground. Now, as current flows through the JFET and then through R1, a positive voltage drop appears across R1. So this raises the voltage at the source, which as far as the JFET is concerned, looks exactly the same as applying a negative voltage from the gate to source. So just like earlier, this closes up the JFET, reduces the current, but then that reduces the voltage across R1, which opens the JFET back up again. This process will continue until the JFET settles down into a nice steady state. This is a pretty useful circuit in its own right, and you often see these as current sources that are relatively independent of the supply rail. So let's now have a look at how this affects the gain equation. So this is our non-inverting gain equation, but instead of just R1, we have a JFET in series with R1. So the JFET starts off fully open, which looks like a nice low resistance. And I'll just put some other values in just so we can get a nice picture of what's going on. So we pick this resistor so that we start off with the gain greater than three, and then the oscillations will build up, which will increase the current, increasing that voltage drop across R1 and throttling back the JFET. As the JFET throttles back, the gain may decrease to below 3, which would reduce the current, opening the FET back up again, increasing the gain. So this process continues until the JFET is holding the gain at exactly 3. This combines with the feedback ratio of a third to give a total loop gain of 1. Okay, so I've just added this JFET here. We've got this um, resistor going down to ground, holding the gate at ground. And we're putting the body of the JFET in series with this trim pot here which I can then just trim to the right value, which will set the oscillations up, and then the um, resistance of the JFET will rise, throttling back the gain and keeping our oscillations at a constant. So if we have a look on the oscilloscope here, we should be able to see this in action. And there we see we've got some nice, consistent oscillation, and we've got a nice looking pure sign. Okay, so in order to control the pitch of this, we can replace these two resistors here with a ganged potentiometer. And then we can vary both of these resistances simultaneously, and that will allow us to vary the pitch. So if I get a dual ganged potentiometer here and I just pop it right in there, 
So if we have a look on the scope here, we can see that I can vary the frequency of this wave by turning this potentiometer. And if we have a listen to that, we hear that we've still got that nice clean sine tone. So we do have a little problem here with this circuit. So if we listen here, we can hear there's no distortion whatsoever, really pure sine wave. Right, and as I increase the frequency, we hear more and more of that distortion. So essentially what's going on here is we can see on the oscilloscope, during the lower portions, when the output goes below ground, that's obviously an issue for our circuit because that's going to change the gain because now the gate to source voltage is no longer positive. So what we've been doing is basically dropping a little bit of voltage across this resistor here in order to make the gate lower in potential than the source. But the source here because the output is going negative, we can see the blue signal is the source, it's going below the gate in voltage. So, essentially, as we listen to this, the worse and worse that becomes as the amplitude increases, I'm just increasing the amplitude here, the more distortion we hear. And so essentially a bit of a, my little hacky fix that I've um, bodged together here. So if we put a diode with the cathode connected to the output and the anode connected to the gate, what that basically does is when the output goes low, we can see now, if I just increase the gain on the oscilloscope, that that keeps the source lower than the gate. So if we just short the gate straight down to the output, then we'll be all right. And so let's have a look and a listen at that. One thing you can actually do with the diodes, instead of doing the JFET malarkey, is you can actually just use two anti-parallel diodes, but back straight onto the inverting input. And so now if I leave this just biased up a little bit like this, we can see here that we've got a little bit of non-linearity coming in from the diodes. So that is a thing when you're using the diodes, um, but we can just back that off a little bit. So that's a couple of different ways that you can set this circuit up. I'll leave um, schematics down in the description for all the different ways that you that I've just shown you. And um, on top of that, let's try, let's have a look at what happens if we add um, some voltage control into this circuit. So just like in my last video, you can use a JFET as a voltage controlled resistor in place of this variable potentiometer, or um, for a bit of variation and to just introduce you to different methods of voltage control, we're going to make some Vactrals. And what a Vactral is, is just a light dependent resistor and an LED bunted up against one another like this and taped up, you know, as light proof as you can possibly make it. I've only got this crappy tape, so it's not going to do a very good job. Do a better job than me. Um, and basically what that's going to do is as the light of the LED increases, it decreases the resistance of this light dependent resistor. So this is just a really easy and straightforward way of putting voltage control in a circuit that doesn't have it. Because as you've seen in the last couple of videos, it's not always trivial putting voltage control into a circuit. And sometimes you just want to replace a resistor with something that you can control electronically. And the Vactrals are a really easy, cheap, and fun way of doing that. So what we can see here, well, what we can't see here because it's wrapped up in tape. And if we have a look at the oscilloscope here, we can see it's oscillating at a particular frequency. I'm just applying a control voltage here through this red crocodile clip. Now I've got two trim pots here just to try and get these two Vactrals to be slightly better matched because obviously two random LEDs and two random light dependent resistors wrapped up in a 
basically random amount of tape are not going to have very good um, matching characteristics so I had to just match them a little bit by just kind of changing the amount of current that goes through the LED and trying to match it that way. I've managed to blag it I think. Um, so as I change my control voltage here what you should see is as I increase the voltage that will increase the brightness of the LED decreasing the value of those resistors increasing the frequency. Um, so let's have a look on the oscilloscope and see what we get. And so as we see as I increase this control voltage the frequency increases and as I go back down frequency decreases. Right and let's just have a listen to that. That's how you make yourself a nice simple sine wave oscillator. So this is a really cool circuit. So why don't we see it that much? Well, generally the way that most oscillators are designed is they're designed around some sort of waveform that is then very easy to derive other waveforms from. We call these circuits oscillator cores and you usually see cores made of either sawtooth or triangle waves because these are then relatively easy to get squares, sines, saws or triangles depending on which core you used out of that and then they're all locked into the exact same frequency which is really helpful from a sound design point of view because you don't have to worry about oscillators kind of drifting out of tune or phase with one another. So the next few videos we're going to design an oscillator core and then we're going to look at the control voltage and how to put the correct voltages into that core and then finally we're going to add the wave shaping that you need to take that core and make all of your other waveforms from it. So if you've enjoyed this video and you want to help support me to make more, please consider supporting me on Patreon where I upload these videos early and upload extra design videos, answer Patreon questions and other bonus content. If not, then make sure to subscribe, leave a like or a comment, share it with your friends and most importantly, come back next time where there's lots more synthy goodness to come. See you then. Bye bye.